Welcome to Your Food Business Success. This podcast is for early stage entrepreneurs in the packaged food industry ready to finally turn that delicious idea into reality. I'm your host, Sari Kimball. I have guided hundreds of food brand founders to success as an industry expert and business coach, and it's got to be fun. In this podcast, I share with you mindset tools to become a true entrepreneur and run your business like a boss. Interviews with industry experts to help you understand the business you are actually in and food founder journeys so you can learn what worked and didn't work and not feel so alone in your own journey. Now let's jump in. Welcome everybody back to the podcast. I have a special guest on with me this week. Karen Green is here with me today and she's basically my counterpart. Uh, we're very similar roles and businesses. She is based, uh, she works with clients in the UK and she actually lives in France. So uh, possibly the, the farthest different time zone um, I've talked with. So very excited to talk with Karen. She is also known as the food mentor. She works with food and beverage drink challenger brands in the UK, helping them to grow and get retailer listings. She is the best-selling author of Recipe for Success, the ingredients of a profitable food business, and a regular speaker at foodie events around the world. So welcome, Karen. Thank you for inviting me. It's really exciting to talk to you. Fill in some of those details for me. Tell us a little bit more about you and your background, who you work with, et cetera. So I've always been in retail, right from, well, I was born into retail. My father ran a department store um, and I studied retail at university and then went to work for Tesco, which is a big grocery multiple in the UK. Um, and then really have had a, a career from on a sales and marketing basis, um, working for a variety of different, both retailers and then um, brands. And in the last seven years, um, I've been running my own business, Food Mentor. Um, and, you know, clues in the title, I mentor food and drink businesses, helping them um, to grow. And the majority of my clients are the smaller startups um, who have got ready really to go out and sell to back to grocery retailers. So kind of almost bringing my career full circle. Um, and yeah, they honestly vary from, oh my goodness, sushi to kombucha to coated nuts, anything and chocolate. I'm, I'm, I'm having quite a lot of focus about chocolate at the moment. Oh my gosh. I'm so on board with the chocolate. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a really interesting category and it's, um, yeah, so that's, I've, I've got some clients, um, through the UN, um, so I'm working through the International Trade Center with, um, 11 Ghanaian chocolatiers. So it's, and I've just come back actually from a trip to Ghana to, to visit some of their factories. So it's been really interesting. Very, very blessed to do that. Yeah, we get to work with the most amazing people and the variety is so fun and all the different kinds of businesses that I'm sure we both get to work with. Yeah, absolutely. Keeps it fresh. All right. I am excited to jump into virology. And this is a framework that you've developed. You're writing a book about it. Uh, it's something that you use with your clients. So let's talk about virology and how that can help people listening here today. So virology is, yeah, it's, it's a word I've coined. Um, and it's basically the, the study of buyers um and it's it's very much focused on commercial um corporate buyers rather than consumers although i think it is it is relevant to consumers but it's largely looking at how buyers function um and you can't have a have a, a book or a concept without a matrix. Um, and I have a, a three by three matrix, which basically looks at the interaction between the buyer as a person, as a human, as an individual, um, and then how they interact with the corporation and then the impact of the corporation. Because I think in a lot of cases, when we're selling, when we're selling into retailers, 
um, or selling to anybody, we tend, if it's a corporate business to business, we tend to focus on the cust- on the on the corporation. So we go, okay, what does this business do? We might, if we if we're good at what we do, we might go, well, let's go and have a look at the strategy. Let's look at their website, etc. And we have a good understanding of the corporate requirements, but we maybe don't think, well, who's going to be sitting across me at, on the table? Um, and as I say, there is that then that third element of how is that buyer as a human interacting with the corporation? And that's another bit that's really interesting to think about. Um, so in terms of the buyer, what I um, have worked on is digging into how do we find out who we're going to be selling to as a human before we get to the meeting. Um, and there's various tricks that you can use to, to find that out. And also, obviously, when you get into that meeting, what do you do when you're in, sitting across that person? How can you very quickly go, right, actually, I've got the measure of this person um, and therefore adapt how you sell? And that's that's the crux of it. So you can do all this research and understand, but then the second part of, of the, the, the concept and the book goes on to say, well, actually, now what? What do I do? So um, can I give you an example? Does, does that help just to flesh, to flesh it out? So um, one of the, the, the kind of the most important part to me is, is the buyer's personality. So um, there's, a, there's a couple of ways you can look at this. The simplest one is, um, are they are they visual, are they auditory, or are they kinesthetic? So we all absorb information in different ways or learning in different ways. So I'm very visual, so I like to watch things. So if, if I'm going to a lecture or a podcast, actually a podcast, not an example, um, I want to watch somebody do something. An auditory person is listening. So a podcast is perfect for that. And I do listen, you know, I will listen to water books and, and podcasts when I walk, but my, my key learning style is visual. And then there's the kinesthetics who actually are, they want to touch. So if you're actually, and now, you know, we are more doing in, in real life in-person meetings, um, you need to give that type of person something to hold. So the way you can assess them is you listen to, to their language. So I would say to you, I see what I see what you're saying. So I'm talking in a visual language. Or you might have someone go, oh, I hear you. Or you might have someone go, well, I feel da, 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 da. Now, we all use those phrases in different situations. So, you know, it's not a perfect model, but it will give you an idea of, you know, do you need, if you're selling to somebody, do you need to show them pictures or do you need to to talk to them and it's the same if so then you transfer that into whether you're going to if you're going to write an email so if I'm sending an email to me send me a picture if 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 you're sending one to an auditory person maybe you just put a little video with some with some um audit or um sound on it it's just it's thinking that through. So that's that's one model. And then another one which I use is disc profiling. Um, and that's a whole other opportunity to to profile a buyer. Um, and you, you you can use LinkedIn and it's really interesting and it's really accurate. So anyway, I'll stop talking because I'll, otherwise I'll just carry on all, <laughs> all day telling you. Well, All right. So much good stuff there to unpack. I think the first thing that comes up for me is just a reminder that it's not the entity of Whole Foods or Costco. You are actually interacting with a real buyer, a real person who's having human emotions, who's having good days and bad days. We were just talking about this inside Food Business Success on a group call, and one of the members uh, submitted her samples to Whole Foods, and it was very much, you know, very nerve-wracking, and and we just reminded her that, you know, there is a real person behind uh, this decision, and that they do care about other people, and they care about the health of their store. And fingers crossed, those samples will arrive on a day that they are having a great day and they are really open, but you just never know. Yeah, exactly. And and that's one of the 
one of the, the the pieces of that part of that three by three is actually yes you can you can look at the personality but as you say they might have had a row with their partner they might have had a really bad journey into work they might have some other crisis when you hit them with oh buy my product and they might be do you know what i just don't have time for this today <laughs> Um, right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, in some cases, there's not a lot you can do about that. You have to just um, put it in context. But it's if you're aware of all these things, I mean, you, we can overthink it, obviously. And, it, you know, if you get too into it, it just blows your mind. But um, if you're at least aware of it, it can enable you to adapt and, and, and change your presentation. I think, you know. I used to run a program called Pitch Perfect and I've changed the name to Retail Already because I suddenly had a realization probably about, ooh, probably about a year ago, I was like, there isn't a perfect pitch because mm. every pitch has to adapt. Yes, if you can adapt and, and shift and pivot on the fly, then, then it would be a perfect pitch. Yes. <laughs> and I think certainly for a lot of my clients, and I don't know about yours, but they're probably more fledgling in the art of selling, that pivoting takes experience. Um, and I often, I, I sometimes accompany my clients when, when we've got a, a major meeting with a major malt, and I'll be, or we'll be presenting and they'll say, the buyer will say something and we get into a conversation and then my client will go back to the pitch. And, and, and I'm kind of like, oh, okay, let's, let's just, and you, you need to change direction and, and that needs a bit of confidence. And yeah. you know, I, I run, an, as mentioned, this program retail already, um, and we do teach some confidence techniques. So some techniques of what to do when you're in a situation where you go, oh, my God, <laughs> this is getting a bit scary or um, a bit stressful, which I think is also really helpful. I feel like that's so important that we are practicing on less intense, less stressful situations, right? <laughs> that we can practice around us when we go out to eat or go to the coffee shop or hanging out with friends and really start trying to pick up on some of those social cues and awareness and pivot the conversation in a low stakes environment. Yeah. And, and just, I think, like I say, knowledge is power. And, and being aware of it is, I think, is, is half the battle. If you kind of go, okay, I, I know that. Yeah. And like you say, if you can practice with less important ones so you go well it's okay which is why i think the progression from um and i don't know if your clients do this but here in the uk it's a lot of um markets people tend to start with markets maybe do a little bit of direct to consumer so they start to get to know their marketplace yeah. and then they might sell to their local deli but they probably know the local deli because they've been shopping there so all of those are comfortable so what you've got to do is just keep extending what is my comfort zone. Um, and I'll be honest, you know, when I go and present to somebody like Tesco's, especially with, with clients now, I always have a little bit of a butterfly in my stomach. I still go, oh, God, how's it going to be? Even though I've got, you know, gosh, 30 years of experience of, 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 of doing this. Um, so the more confidence and experience you can build up in the in your comfort zone, and then you can start to extend that out. I'm a really big fan of building up confidence with small steps. And I recently just had a podcast about building courage by doing kind of microdosing courage moments and working up to that because I have clients, I'm sure you do too, where they just want to take such big leaps. Like they just launched a product and they want to get in front of Costco. And I really think that you need to build up the muscle of confidence and courage. And I do think that this biology framework is something that can be a really great tool. Start practicing it now on the smaller accounts and in social circles so that you feel really comfortable when you have those big accounts and those big pitches. Yeah. And the other thing I think you have to think about is what's, who are you? What's your style? Because I remember, I mean, this is a long time ago and, and just even admitting it sounds ridiculous now. 
But when I first started working, um, I think it was for Boots, actually, I just assumed everyone was the same as me. So when I came across people who I'm, I'm a high red, I'm very active, I'm an action taker, I want things done now. And, and I came across someone who didn't. And I was like, why is this guy really so strange? And then they sent us on some course and we did some personality analysis. And I realized actually he was a completely different, uh, the opposite side to me in terms of his approach. Your self-awareness is really important when you're selling because um, if I meet someone who, who has a blue personality, who's very detailed, who's very slow at making decisions because they need to have covered all the bases and you can hear, I'm actually slowing my voice down as I'm talking about them. And I go in, right, so I've got this product and it's $2.99 and, you know, this is the data that from our other sales and, and, you know, you should stock it. That person's going to be going, whoa. <laughs> so it's, so but also you know i had a buyer who was a very strong blue personality and um i was commercial director and he drove me insane because he used to ask for information i was like why do you want all this stuff you don't need to know this yeah <laughs> and i and, and it was only when i came across this this whole idea of disc profiling um and i profiled him and i went oh my goodness that's the problem you're finding you need to think about who you are and why this guy is is causing that problem so um yes knowing knowing yourself can really help um you sell butter as well because you'll understand what you need i've heard those colors before i might have been an amy porterfield podcast but i think it works too you know, it's one thing when you're pitching to a person like a retailer and, and a buyer, and you can learn more about that. But um, also thinking about your, if you're doing direct to consumer, uh, like your emails, um, you should have something that speaks quickly and directly to the reds, but then you can also include more detail and, you know, really get into the weeds a little bit more for some of the other personalities. So I, I yeah, love no, that framework. That's... It's it's hard to do um, because you then you you know you've got the people people who are, are are much more about hi how are you did you have a great weekend I've been doing this and dava dava and I buy, and I get if I get a people person I'm like are we going to get to the point where's the point oh the point. <laughs> what do you want <laughs> well I think when you're crafting emails and this would definitely be like going to a buyer and and also like your emails to your yeah, online customers is like, sometimes I'm a red, right? I get to the point, I'm direct, like write an email and then I'll go back and include the hi. <laughs> That's a great Soften weekend. It, but... After and, the and then maybe what you do for the detail beetles is you add an attachment or something or send them somewhere. I don't know, but you're, you're right. It's a little yeah. bit like I did some um, train the trainer training and there when you're speaking, and again, this is important in pitching, people can either be auditory, visual or kinesthetic. So you need something someone can watch, something mm -hmm. they can listen to and something they can get hold of. Um, and again, it's, it's thinking about how do I weave that in um, to, to the overall. And it's interesting actually, because obviously podcasts are just auditory. Um, and I sure. I listen to podcasts when I'm out walking the dog. Um, but I was listening to one. I, was, I don't know if you guys ever listened to um, Stephen Bartlett, the diary of the CEO, but I can really recommend it. He does some amazing interviews. But I was listening to it in the car. And actually, I was really struggling. And, and so... I'm, and I know I'm not auditory, I'm more visual. So maybe I need to watch him doing it. I don't know. But um, but all of that comes. Right. So many people have do it on YouTube as yeah. well, which is nice. So, so. But, but it kind of brings it back yeah. to the fact that when you're selling, an understanding of your buyer needs to go more much more deeply than we normally do, which is probably pop down and have a look around the shop before we go and sell. And that your buyer, in the case of a retailer, is then also thinking about their buyer. So you kind of have a two-layer, yeah. you know, you need to per pitch to the retailer why this would be a good thing for yeah, their no, buyer. That's true, actually. Yeah, it's it's the B2B is, is B2B and therefore B2C. It's, um, 
it's it's complex. But I think, you know, if, if your listeners are thinking they're going, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, this is too complicated. Ah, don't sweat it. Honestly, just being aware of it is half the battle um, because, sure. you know, even if you go away with just one thought that, um, I don't know, maybe think about the buyer as a human. I think that's, you know, at the moment, again, so many people pitched last week and now they're going to me, I've not heard anything yet. And I'm like, it's like literally only four days. <laughs> think of the buyer as a human. They just got back <laughs> to the office. Monday is figures day. They've got a hundred other things to do. You're not top of their priority list right now. Yeah. My, my takeaway is like, it's not about you. Make it about yeah. them and don't take anything personally. Realize that yeah, they are human and they're having, <laughs> maybe they're out on vacation. Now they're catching up from vacation or um, they're dealing with a lot of, you know, I know when I worked for Whole Foods Market, there was a lot of internal pressures, right? And so I had to balance my priorities to, you know, to be successful in my job with other people's requests. Yeah. No, it's a juggle. So. so we've been talking about biology and this framework and the colors what would you say is the biggest takeaway that someone could put into action right after listening to this podcast that could be um, that next step? Because I know it can maybe feel a little overwhelming, all of these pieces at once. Get to know the person um, in, in any way you can. So do your research is probably the best the best advice I would give. So do the research on, on the person if you can. And, you know, once once you get two or three people in front of you, maybe you've got a buying panel or you've got a buyer and her boss, then that's when life becomes very interesting and quite complicated. But I think at, right. at, the, at the basic <laughs> level, just do your research. And LinkedIn, and, and actually the, LinkedIn is your friend. And I, right. I'm a massive fan of LinkedIn and and um some people like yourself like me are highly evolved do a lot of LinkedIn um but then for example some of my Ghanaian companies don't have a profile or it's not really set up properly I'm like please do do that do do your LinkedIn get connected so that you can go and find these people um and you learn so much you know, about the company, you'll learn about the people, you'll learn about, you know, you might find out what their interests are, and it just makes it that much easier. But those are yeah. for bigger corporations. For the smaller ones, you know, like your independent, even your independent deli, you know, go and see what they're doing on Insta, see what, see if they've been in the local news. Just It just gives you a hook and it makes you stand out, especially if you're in a competitive marketplace and you want to stand out from the rest. People like people who are interested in them and if mm -hmm. you can demonstrate that i think that's really good so yes the one take one thing i would do is do your research um and the second one is is sort yourself out on linkedin i love that and i love that you talked about building your networks and community and how important that is i just had another guest on uh who was talking and we that's all we talked about was linkedin and and creating community but you're not going to do this alone. And the more you can tap into um, even working with people like yourself or, or me, like it opens up your whole world to all those other, you know, to all the people I know, and then people in my group and your groups who know people. So important. And I think it's really underrated and understood. <laughs> and misunderstood. And I think it is misunderstood. And I think, you know, I've run how many I think I've run four cohorts now of this program in different formats but the thing that's come out most strongly in the last two I've run is the supportive nature of the group even though yeah they've learned lots of stuff and we've done some you know lots of practice and we've profiled buyers and we've done pitch documents and we've practiced pitching and selling the bit that everyone seems to talk about is, oh my goodness, it's been so great because such and such was so supportive and, and I had a pitch with the co-op and they've helped me with that. And that's that's kind of gold dust that, that just comes. And I think we're missing a bit of that with this whole, you know, I, I don't know what it's been like in the US, but this whole remoteness for the last two years, 
when I was at Bread and Jam last week, it's the first time I've seen a lot of these clients in the flash, you know, actually met people. And the energy yeah. and the vibrancy of meeting people in person is is quite awesome, actually. So, um, yeah, right. but it's not so easy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's, I think there's a place for both and it is really special to have those in person, but it is nice to have online and virtual because people can be coming from anywhere and, you know, they don't all have to be in the same place, but I think it's just such an underrated benefit of, of working, you know, inside groups. And so it's the investment of working with somebody like yourself or working with me, but then take advantage of that benefit of the community. So I just can't, <laughs> I can't put a finer, you know, <laughs> a finer point on it um, over and over again, how important that is. So I'm glad you said that. Let's transition. And, uh, you know, as we're both uh, work with a lot of clients and sometimes I just, I look from afar and I say, gosh, if I was you, here's what I would do. I wish I could wave my magic wand. So if you were in your client's shoes right now, you know, 2022, heading into the holidays, obviously all the issues of inflation and all the things, um, what are what are three things if you were in charge <laughs> that you would do uh, if you were a food business? Um, I guess we, I mean, we're recording this kind of end of July. So in terms of time specific, um, in the UK, Christmas is bigger than Thanksgiving. But regardless, I think I would be thinking about what have I got my plan in place for for those two big holidays. And actually now, of course, we have Black Friday, which is the Amazon piece as well. So um, I'm not so sure about Black Friday, but I guess um, certainly Christmas now um if you're not ready for Christmas you're probably a bit late I don't know whether it's the same in the US but certainly in the UK it's it's a bit but I would certainly be making sure that I have the Christmas range sorted out the Christmas countdown in terms of marketing um which is really hard hard to do it's 35 degrees here in in South France today and thinking about you know snow and Christmas is really hard but um, I would certainly be focusing in on that. Um, the second thing I would be doing is um, working on the marketing on a broader sense. I think a lot of food businesses, especially the smaller ones that we deal with, are so preoccupied with making the products and getting them out there and getting them delivered and maybe going and doing some food markets that kind of forget you need to be out there doing your marketing you need to be putting your content out churning it out and and getting that engagement so I think that would be a second point and then the right. third one really is is about the tough conditions that we've got at the moment because I, again, you know, in the UK, we we have a lot of inflation. I know you guys do in the US as well. Um, and food inflation and transport and packaging and Amazon have stolen all the cardboard. <laughs> Maybe they haven't, but that's what I heard. Um, and so basically, <laughs> we're in this position where supply is compromised. Um, the, the shape of um, of the availability of some raw materials is changing. So the traditional shape that you would might be expecting. So there might be a shortage of this or a shortage of that. Um, so I would be wanting to look at the business and say, right, what do I need to do for inflation? So many of my clients are guilty of not keeping an eye on the profit level. You know, are you making enough money? Are you, are you charging in your own time, actually? I mean, this isn't about inflation, but it's just my own little personal <laughs> bugbear that I'm going to weave in just here because it seemed like a good place to put it. But, um, you know, are you making money from your product? Are you accounting for the inflation? Are you, you know, are you ready to go in? And, and if you've already got a few existing listings to go in and say, look, I'm really sorry, but the price is going up. Um, yeah. And if you haven't already, think about, well, what's the mitigating? 
um, opportunities? What can I do to offset some of that cost? You know, are there possibilities to compromise on on the ingredients? Are there possibilities to substitute something that's a bit cheaper? Which I know for a lot of smaller businesses, you know, a lot of artisan food companies have set themselves up to offer something better. And if you are offering something better, then I'm afraid people are going to have to pay for it. So you don't have to take cost out. But um, I think these are tough times. Um, and again, the cost of money is going up. So if you need to borrow for your business, invest in your business, then again, thinking about that element as well, which is which is all kind of serious stuff. But um, we don't want to be busy fools. You know, we can. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. I love these. There's Let's a lot there. We'll work backwards. <laughs> but yeah, essentially, I mean, all of them really dive into planning. And like you said, there's a lot of people working in their business, right? Doing the things, but working on your business is really the p the part of being the CEO of your business and stepping back a little bit, taking that, you know, 35,000 foot view versus right on in it. So when it comes to the financials, I mean, knowing your cost of goods sold, having a cash flow, I can't tell you how many times I talk to people and they're not including their labor, their cost of goods sold isn't up to date, and then they're not doing a regular cash flow. And they just have no idea what's going on in their business financially. And then everything is last minute. Oh, I think I need to raise my prices yeah. now. <laughs> and, you know, it takes time. Most, most sort of buyers, especially if some of the smaller malts and the bigger malts, you know, they're going to take as long as they can. So you could be like three to six months before you get that price increase through. So um, it's... And I get it. It's hard. You know, if you've if, if you spend all that time planning Christmas and working on your marketing and selling and making the stuff, as a, a, I, I get it. I'm, being an entrepreneur is tough. It really is tough. Yeah. But if we're doing all that and at the end of the month, and I've had, you know, even in my business, which is consultancy, so I don't obviously have a cost of goods, but I spend money on marketing and, and various bits and bobs. And I've sat down with my accountant a couple of times and gone, so it says I earned this. Why haven't I got any money? <laughs> Where's it gone? Wait a and second. She, Somebody's she's like, well, you, you should know. And I'm like, well, <laughs> where's it gone? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's tough. Don't be hard on yourself. We're all in the same boat, but yeah. Well, I think the best phrase we can have that I utilize a lot is it is what it is. And not in a defeatist way, but like, okay, this is what we're dealing with. And then let's get to work. But I think a lot of times we're avoiding the issue. And so we spend a lot of resources of like procrastinating and spinning in our brain instead of just saying, let me put this on my calendar. This hour, I'm going to work on my cash flow or I'm going to update my cogs. Like, it doesn't actually take that long. It's just, <laughs> I think sometimes we we spend a lot of energy trying to avoid it because it feels big and overwhelming. Yeah, no, I, I think that's true. And I think yeah. a lot I, that now there's so many um, packages, accounting packages that can do most of the heavy lifting for you. And I think that's that's yeah. really useful as well. So you're right. It's it's an hour, maybe an hour a month, and that's it. But it's an hour a month that we often don't find. So right. And so it, it needs to become a priority. And, and then the same with the planning of your holidays. And, you know, for some of my clients, yes, Thanksgiving can be the your biggest one. A lot of people for it's Christmas and the, the gifting. And then I have some clients that, you know, new um, kind of that January um, health, Honest. you know, yeah. get people wanting to yeah, no, <laughs> get, yeah, get healthy and all their resolutions is the thing. So in any case, you know, we are working on that in food business success uh, in August, making sure people have a plan. But yeah, I agree. I mean, when I was at Whole Foods, uh, we had our plan in July, which also meant that, you know, bigger brands needed to be getting their their holiday products ready like a year before so that 
we knew what was coming up because then we had to have a plan. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so no, we, we used to do um, a review. Once people came out with their Christmas ranges, we would be planning for the following Christmas. So you do a, you would do a range yeah. review probably in December um, with a view to, to locking it down, I don't know probably April time because yeah. of course a lot of products are, are certainly here in the UK are brought in from the far east and you've probably got six weeks six sorry six months lead time probably longer with the right. shipping the cost of shipping now and then yeah and that's the same for all of these things right like in order to plan for the holidays like what is available and you might have to shift from what you've done last year because of supply chain so just getting in front of it and again you're going to have to make it a priority and put some time on your calendar. But doing something ahead of time takes way less energy than trying to do it last minute. Cause you're going to be you're like, Oh, <laughs> it's November. And Oh, yeah. I should have a black Friday thing. Right. It takes way more time. Yeah. No, and you're going to be paying rush costs and you know, those kinds yes. of things. So, too. so plan. Plan, plan, plan. Yes. And things like getting, you know, the content, the photography and the packaging, like there's a process there and it does take time. So I think those are spot on. I love that. That's, um, and again, it's easier said than done, but this is part of being an entrepreneur and putting on your CEO hat. So just, it's got to be a priority. We're on the same page there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we're here. That's why we help these people, you know, all of our clients to help give, I think accountability is a big one, right? We talked about community already, but when you have somebody, you know, you made an investment in a program and then you have somebody as a mentor or coach that's holding you accountable and, you know, you don't feel so alone and you don't feel like who cares anyway? <laughs> it doesn't even Absolutely. matter. And there's lots of, I mean, I had a, a book coach actually when I wrote my first book and that, that was a really good 12 week structured program. And there was group calls, but I actually had the, the add on the VIP, which I offer in my course as well, where you, you had a weekly call and I didn't want to let it down. I was like, goodness me. I, I'm, and I also was, in because I was kind of like, well, there were, I think there were 12 other people on the group. And I was like, well, I want to get my book finished. I don't want to, everyone else to have a book and me not have a book. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that because you're strategizing ahead. Like, I know I'm not going to want to do this. Uh -huh. This sounds terrible. My brain is saying this is hard. But if you plan in and you make some investments in a coach and a group that's holding you accountable, it'll really help you keep going even when you don't want yeah. to. Yeah. And I think I, it's made me think about something actually. And, and, but you need to be ready to come on a group because every time I re, I run one of these programs, there's probably, there's certainly one person, maybe two who I never see. They hand over the cash, you know, like you go to the gym and think, right, I'm going to, I'm going to go to the gym. This is going to get me fit. And you, you hand over your whatever it is, $50, $100 a month, and you think, right, I'm going to the gym. And you maybe go twice. And you don't cancel it because you think, well, I might still be going. I still might still, And they've got great gym, great lessons, great everything you need to get you fit, and you don't do it. And occasionally, and I have somebody on my, my group that we've just closed out, and she kind of went, but I haven't, I haven't, I haven't achieved anything. And I'm kind of, what? And, and yeah. there's that question of, well, have you done everything? Have you, you know, what's missing? What are we not, what's not being done? And then there's definitely one person who never showed. I've just been so ridiculously busy and I did sign up to something um, and I will go back to it, but I haven't done all the modules. And I think when you do think about doing something like that, if you're coming, say you are coming into the Christmas period, this is not the time, that would not be the time to sign up. To a program don't if, if christmas is your big and it is for a lot of food businesses so if december's a big selling month do not sign up for a program <laughs> note to my own self i'm not going to launch another retail already in december <laughs> something completely new yeah start a whole new thing oh uh, so good yeah it it happens and that and we're human that's part of it we get a little excited right go join the gym but uh the next piece is like 
showing up and committing and putting on your calendar, making it a priority. Uh, all right, let's talk about Bread and Jam Fest because I'm not super familiar with this, um, but this is the biggest, one of the biggest um, food founder festivals in the UK. Will you tell us sure. more about Sure, so this? Bread and Jam's been going for, I think it's six years, pretty much as long as I have. Um, and they support food and drink challenger brands or startup food brands um so probably very similar space to to you and i um and through the year they hold socials they do some webinars there's a there's a great group facebook group called food hub forum uh they've got about twelve thousand food and drink um members in there which is really useful to go in and and if you've got a question and and i use it as well um ask people you know do you know such and such again back to that community thing and then once a year they have this enormous festival it used to be in october but they've now moved it to july um and basically it gives um challenger brands two days of meeting people like myself so you know you can they they have an exhibition of all the service providers so whether you're looking for packaging design or accountants or business mentors all of those people are there but they also have I think it's five stages with different speakers through the two days so anything from again how to raise finance how to claim tax back how to um they do some interviews with successful brands I did an interview um with a lady who who won a Gordon Ramsay um food stars program and what she's been doing um and then the 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 piece that I'm involved with which I sponsor is the retail pitching so they bring along some of the key smaller retailers um so people who would be right for 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 their target audience so the startup brands um and you can apply to pitch um there's no guarantee they had a staggering 2800 applications this year so you can if you put that in context um i don't know i think there was probably about mm, 200 opportunities to pitch i haven't added it up actually so um a one in 10 chance um but we did really well my clients got well over 20 pitches i think one of the people on uh the retail already program got six pitches so if you put that in context it's we've we've done really well um and have some really good success so that's what bread and jam is um two days of frenetic activity <laughs> and meeting loads and loads and loads of people yeah. so you know if any of your clients want to come over um it's it's a really it's a really good session and i had um i have clients i work with the un and we had people over from where were they from the caribbean eswatini africa west africa as well as east africa quite a range of people and we took them around and showed them some stores as well so if you're if you're over next year I am putting it on my, yeah, my bucket list. I'm coming. I'll come hang out with you. Maybe I can be a, yeah, you know, come help you with the break. The it's amazing. <laughs> I love that. Well, I asked you what some takeaways were for you. So tell me about personal branding. So personal branding is key. What, tell me a little bit more it's, about that. It's something that's sort of came out quite strongly. So, so Victoria from somewhere who I was interviewing, um, she she makes uh, health and well-being products and she was talking about how she'd got to where she was and how she'd she'd promoted her brand but she'd also been working on her personal brand so she has her own instagram plus the brand instagram and another client in fact the lady mm. who i mentioned who had the six pitches lauren she won she got a, a listing in a small um retailer um as a result of the last bread and jam actually back in October. Um and she's been putting herself out there. She's she's regularly on LinkedIn, she shares how the brand's going, she shares her successes. Um, but she's also now, you know, she, I think she spoke at Bread and Jam. She definitely spoke at another event. There's a business called Enterprise Nation, which again works with small food businesses. She sp- definitely spoke there. So she's been really raising her profile. So I think the benefit of that is that 
if you can put across your own personal value set, which obviously have to resonate with the brand, when you do go and turn up to see that buyer or you write them the email, they know who you are. You know, I, I teach that you have to touch someone seven times before they take action. And, you know, it may well be more than that but we go through seven different ways of, of touching somebody or, or so that the buyer has hopefully had the opportunity to see you seven times and actually if you do the personal branding piece that's kind of you're doubling your opportunity to be seen um and so mm -hmm. and, and I, yeah. they did a, there was a couple of people spoke about how personal brandings really helped them um make a difference to to their business and then of course the other upside is if you are looking in for investors it makes it so much easier if if you are relatively well known or you've got a good following because um again you can tap into that network but also you you are better know i mean you know when i went to bread and jam so many people were like oh i read your i read your posts on linkedin and oh da, 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 and they know who i am although i use the brand food mentor it's and it's slightly different because i'm i'm a consultant so i am known for it as well but i think you have the, the balance of the two is really key unfortunately <laughs> for some of my clients they're they're groaning right now. People who don't like to uh, yeah. put themselves up as the face of the brand. And I get it. It's more it work. It is more work. <laughs> and I have clients for whom their brand is a side hustle as well. And that's a challenge because if you're in IT, which a lot of my clients seem to be, um, you're not going to want to go, oh, and by the way, yesterday I was in a market selling, selling hot sauce. Because that's a bit incongruous for right. my career. <laughs> so I get it. And sometimes it doesn't work. But, you know, I think personal branding's come out to me as something that maybe I I certainly haven't taught it as a module. I've taught LinkedIn as a module, but I haven't taught personal branding. And I'm going to be adding that to the next Retailer Ready program because I think it is important. Yeah, I think it is a really great strategy. And it's something I know I've employed a lot more in my business, um, creating Sarah Kimball coaching and having food business success. Um, but the more there's that no like and trust factor. And so even if you just are, you're showing up more on your, your brand's Instagram and you're introducing yourself to people, and it's not just all about the product, product, product. I think that that's um, at least a good yeah. first step. Um, maybe before you launch into like a whole, you know, your personal brand, but this is the way things are going. So better to get on now. That's the, that's the cliche people buy from people. So, you know, it's worth thinking about. Is Retailer Ready, and we'll put the link uh, to your website in the show notes, but is Retailer Ready appropriate for people in the US or is it mainly for people in the UK? How does that work? How do you think that so translates? I think there are elements of it i think it would translate better than it did we did have somebody about three cohorts ago who came in from the us and she was a little uncomfortable because we were talking just about uk retail i've kind of stopped that now so what we're teaching is more about the um we obviously do do talk about uk retailers but what we're talking about are the is the toolkit so the marketing the personal branding the trade marketing um the commercial side of it doing the numbers making sure you're making money how to put a pitch together how to profile your buyer all of those are relevant i think wherever you are um the the content yeah. that goes into a presentation honestly changes in the UK um, whether you're talking to a small independent deli versus Tesco. So um, that adaptation will is is up to the person. But the rest of it, yeah, I think retail already could be really useful and a really good insight and a different perspective, maybe. And then obviously, if and I know yeah. your clients are are probably at, at the early stages, but if anyone's interested in coming into the UK, then obviously, as as I say, we're working with them, people from the Caribbean, people from Africa, and and the purpose of that is to help them to export into the UK. So if anyone wants to come into the UK, then yeah, absolutely, this is, this is a great opportunity for them. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for 
coming on. I know we're in widely different uh, time zones, we but we one. found we <laughs> managed found to keep the, keep the uh, internet and the Wi-Fi going for long enough. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's been a really fun conversation. And is there anything kind of last that you'd love to add and make sure people are thinking about something as you as you sign <laughs> off here? Um, I think I've, I, I, I think I've talked about it already, but money, make money, money. I I think, I think Americans are probably better about talking about money than the British, but um, I always find when I listen to podcasts, no one really goes, let's make some money. And it's about purpose and it's about the branding and it's about, and I, and I truly believe the branding and the purpose and the design are absolutely critical for underpinning, but actually how can we make money don't you know make deals that make you some money that pay the bills that you can reinvest back into your company and i and and my i guess my my closing kind of thought is and i know well i don't know but i suspect most of your 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 listeners will not be massive fans of coca-cola but if you look at coca-cola it's the world's biggest brand and it costs them, I don't know, 10 cents to make a bottle of cola and they can sell it for $2. Okay, so that's one ninety of profit. Okay, maybe the retailer took half of it. We've still got 90 cents a bottle profit. Now, what do you do with that? You can put it in your back pocket, happy days, but actually what you do is you then put it back into the brand and it creates that virtuous circle to grow. And that's why... One of the reasons, anyway, I believe Coca-Cola is obviously so successful. And of course, it's a mature brand. But so that's that's why I think that's that's my parting shot is just think about and I get the fact you love what you do and, and it's really important. And, and I'm truly I do a lot that doesn't give me any money. But think about what I'm doing today. Is it actually going to contribute to making money for my business today? tomorrow in six months yeah. time. It's, it's really important. And I know, yeah, maybe we talk about it a little bit more, uh, <laughs> in the U S but for small brands, it can be a really like, it's dirty it's word. I even talk feel like you're talking about it. I'm like, Oh, maybe I should have just done like nice things, but we've got to make money. Yeah. People, we're in this to make money. We're in this but, for a business. It's, a, it's to have a better yeah. life. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, I'll not, I'll not keep going about it. But. I love it. Yeah. That's a, it's such a good parting, parting words, because if you don't set yourself up to make money, you're not going to be in business very long and it's not going to be sustainable and you're not going to be able to do the good that you want to do in the world. So it's important. It's imperative. <laughs> it is imperative, but thank you so much for, for having me on the show. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. So, and if any of your listeners want to get in touch, then um, they can get me at uh, Karen at foodmentor.co.uk. Not mental, as somebody said to me the other week. Food mental. Okay. <laughs> food mental. <laughs> and then uh, LinkedIn's probably a good place to connect LinkedIn's with you. LinkedIn's where well. I live. So yeah, yeah, come over to LinkedIn I love and you'll it. find me. Good. Well, thank you again, Karen. I hope you have an amazing evening where you're thank at. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just going into evening, starting to cool down a little bit here. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. The smartest thing you can do as an entrepreneur is to invest in a who to help you with the how, to speed up your journey and help you skip the line. When you are ready for more support and accountability to finally get this thing done, you can work with me in two ways. Get me all to yourself with one-on-one business coaching or join Food Business Success, which includes membership inside Fuel, our community of food business founders that includes monthly live group coaching calls and so much more. It's one of my favorite places to hang out and I would love to see you there. Go to foodbizsuccess.com to start your journey towards your own food business success.